The relationship between free trade and the budget, perhaps the first thing to say about this, because um, we've heard now um, about how the people's budget was explosive and dramatic, or perhaps slightly less so, if you uh, follow what uh, uh, Josie Harris said. But I think the main thing perhaps to say in relation to free trade is that the debate and the conflict over the budget did not hit um, a sort of Britain in calm waters, but that in the pr previous seven years, Britain, or political life, had been engulfed in, a, in, in one of the great storms of, of modern history, the battle between free trade and tariff reform. Now, that was temporarily resolved in 1906 with a landslide victory um, for the Liberals, but what really meant was that for the generation going to the polls, or, or those who didn't have the vote uh, praying for or against Lloyd George in 1910, they had been through a, a kind of mass uh, mobilization experience, um, being educated about international affairs and political economy in ways that hadn't really been seen before. And so debates about social justice, the rights and duties of um, citizens as consumers, those had already been out there. Now this may sound all rather academic, so let me give you two sound bites, um, to, uh, two sound effects rather, um, to give you a sense of what Edwardian audiences would have heard in the two elections of 1910, and both come uh, from our friend Lloyd George. At uh, uh, Falmouth in um, January 1910, he addressed a, a large um, outdoor audience, and he said, this land is meant for free trade, cheers. Those beautiful bays are all meant to draw in the good things of the earth from every part, cheers. Germany is a great land country. We are a great sea country. We have the greatest seaports in the world. What is that for? It is to trade with the world, to receive goods from every clime, to send goods to every clime. It is the function which providence seems to have pointed out for us in the very configuration of our great country. Three days earlier, he had talked at Plymouth and said this, he told his audience that what they should really hope for is that the tariff reform policy, so protectionism, would be tried out on the peers who were resisting the budget. Three months of black bread diet and the most juicy horse flesh rump steaks, laughter. I tell you, before they've got through three days, they will say, let's pass the budget, renewed laughter. Those were references to German black bread and Germans being forced to eat horse flesh, not being able to afford you know, a good English uh, uh, rump steak. I will come back to those nationalist comments. Now, the idea that free trade was a vital part of social reform liberalism uh, and, and the budget, that these were symbiotic, was very important. Um, but the question in 1909, 1910 was, would it be possible to have both of these worlds at once? And there were two main challenges. One came from the conservatives um, uh, and tariff reform. And Chamberlain, who in 1903 had launched his massive tariff reform crusade, had very quickly launched onto the idea that one way um, to sell tariffs was to connect it to a social reform policy. The idea that you would use the revenue or some of the revenue generated by tariffs to support um, um, old age pensions. That was one challenge. The second challenge for free traders was that there were not, not all free traders were radical or progressive free traders. There was still a segment of conservative free traders and also liberal unionist free traders. And for them, free trade meant free market and laissez-faire. Strachey, one of their um, active and very vocal uh, um, uh, leaders, um, thought what Lloyd George was doing and Churchill, um, trying to bolt free trade and social 
um, policy together was he called predatory socialism plus demagoguery. The idea was that what uh, the liberals were doing here was introducing projection, protectionism through the back door. Um, that ultimately social protection and the protection of trade were uh, kind of cousins. And the fear was that with social reform, you would um, start a wave of new demands by social groups on the state. And ultimately, that would also uh, uh, produce trade um, protection. So from that kind of conservative free trade uh, uh, viewpoint, um, Lloyd George and the People's budget, budget were very, very dangerous to what Britain in that view was all about, which was about 1688, balanced government, a state which wouldn't interfere too much, and where parliament uh, was really sovereign. Because once these social groups made demands on the state, um, the state would pass or would look after one vested interest after another, and once it was in the budget, parliament uh, would be weakened. Now, liberal, radical free traders had answers to both of these challenges. Now, for um, the Chamberlain argument that tariff would produce revenue, um, they had an obvious um, uh, logical point to point out, that you can't have it both ways. If you want to have trade barriers that protect and keep out goods, then they don't deliver revenue. If they're supposed to deliver revenue, that means they're not really discriminatory and protectionist. So uh, it's uh, illogical. And instead, Lloyd George made a lot about how important free trade was in laying the foundations for um, a more um, 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 a more of a welfare-oriented social policy because free trade created the wealth which could then be um, distributed. And he made a lot about how free trade allowed um, Britain to do what Germany, had to, in a protectionist setting in Germany, had taken several decades. Now, the second answer to the conservative free traders um, was very simple because when they went to the polls in 1910, they got um, butchered. And it's only really Hugh Sissel, uh, one of Salisbury's uh, 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 sons, who survived in Parliament. So how did they do it? Well, one argument, if you're an economist, would be to point um, to the inherent superiority of free trade as a principle of economic governance. And you're all familiar with why uh, free trade has uh, a, a, superior, uh, a superior contribution to wealth and welfare. And there's some, uh, something to that. Um, but I think if you look at the grassroots level, the people who had to go to the polls, what they would have heard is they would not have been hammered with um, economic textbooks. And I think three facets stand out in the way in which free trade managed to really gain the upper hand in the campaign. The first is mass mobilization. Um, uh, Professor uh, Lord Morgan um, alluded to it that in 1908 or 1909, we're seeing an economic downturn, but we're also seeing a renewed, very aggressive um, strategy by the tariff reformers to push protectionism at the grassroots. And the Tariff Reform League is now really going into overdrive. And in that sense, the liberal landslide victory in 1906 proved very hollow. In, in a way, the free traders were too successful for their own good. So by 1907 or 1908, they'd become sort of dormant, happy in having won. And suddenly, in, in many constituencies, there are very aggressive tariff reform crusaders at work um, snatching uh, by-elections and pushing their methods. So the first thing that needed to be done is to revive and renew um, the political campaign at the grassroots level. Now, the man who took a great lead in that in, in, the 19, in 1909 and 1910 um, uh, at that level was really Winston Churchill uh, rather than Lloyd George. And Winston Churchill uh, came, played a kind of um, political general of new campaign groups that were rolled out um, in 1908 and 1909. And one of the first things that Churchill um, pushed very strongly was 
uh, that liberals had to recognize that you can't win in this day and age just having a good argument or having the right numbers, that numbers needed to be sort of downplayed and instead uh, they needed to find a way to tap into the emotions and sell free trade as a religious creed rather than an economic principle. And they did this through a variety of ways by um, uh, pioneering what we would now call political advertising, by copying some of the tricks um, that Chamberlain and his supporters had introduced, um, but also by um, um, expanding and invading parts of the country that had not really been part of mass politics, like seaside resorts. So in 1909, and 1910, in the summer months, you were very likely, I mean, there were thousands of these around, you were likely to encounter some sort of mini rally or some gimmick of free traders trying to um, uh, convert people to their creed. So the, the answer as far as Churchill and the activists were concerned was it was em about emotions, um, that you needed to reach a new generation and revive um, a, a free trade into a national, international mission. Now the second, and here I come back to um, these lovely um, horse flesh, uh, rump steaks, and 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 black bread. Um, I think what's um, important here is that these are sort of partly they are about fun, um, but they're also very very important ways in which liberals now try to sort of dramatize entire complex national systems of political economy and communicate to them to the people. So the white cheap loaf versus the dark, um, uh, horrible black bread. You know, the idea that in one country protection drives people to eat horse flesh, in others they have a healthy uh, uh, um, and increasingly affluent um, diet. And Lloyd George um, was with his brilliant sense for images and, and, and poetry was very, very important um, um, for this because it, it helped to dramatize that these are really two rival um, systems. Um, you couldn't have a sort of middle of the road policy. You were either in one country and one kind of civilization of liberty and, and the white loaf, or you were in a servile police state which had tariffs and, and black bread. There was no middle way. Lord George said protection is like putting your arm into a cogwheel. Once you're in it, it draws you in further and further until it crushes bone and sinew. And that was, of course, the idea of the slippery, uh, the slippery road. Even the small tariffs that Chamberlain had initially suggested, people should really be afraid of because it would trigger an avalanche of demands on the state now, these German stereotypes, I think, are interesting because at the level of policy and um, thinking and planning about the budget, we know, of course, that Lloyd George um, did go to Germany in 1908, was very impressed, as we just heard, um, by uh, the Bismarckian um, regime and studied these um, um, quite, quite, quite carefully. But at the level of um, political communication, of grassroots politics, the Lloyd George we have is someone who uh, made um, more than, than most out of nationalist stereotypes. And I think there's a good argument uh, uh, that one can make that we have here um, really a person who shifts identities and gears. And um, it's a current theme through all his speeches in this period. And I think there's um, a good argument that Lloyd George um, while looking to Germany for inspiration, perhaps, on certain social policy instruments, at the same time also fanned some of the Anglo-German antagonism that led up um, to the First World War. A final point on empire, because I think there's often a tendency um, to instinctively uh, assume a um, automatic instinctive relationship between free trade and cosmopolitanism. And of course, there were many radical internationalists um, like Hobson and others um, for whom free trade was really a weapon against empire. 
I think it's important to remember, and it comes out in these campaigns uh, quite clearly, there were also many free traders for whom free trade and empire walked together. Churchill is one of them, uh, Robert Sissel um, is another, and there the idea is very much that what free trade does is it cements empire, it gives the empire strength because it keeps intra-colonial rivalries over duties out. And you can go um, uh, through the newspapers and um, the liberal campaign sources, um, especially of liberal women who were ag um, agitating in the countryside, and you would get the sense that free trade has really uh, created imperial harmony, eliminated famine in India, a cause for imperial strength and celebration. So I think it's important um, to recognize that in the free trade campaign, it's not that people were sort of given the numbers in a, in a transparent fashion, but all sorts of um, economic and imperial and foreign policy issues um, were um, marginalized or blocked out. So to conclude, as we are living in a time uh, when fair trade is all the fashion, and I know you have fair trade things in your cafeteria here at Treasury, as we do in college, um, I think that there, there are sort of two things to, um, to take away, really. One is that in our current climate, it would be foolish to lose sight of the tremendous democratic um, appeal free trade had 100 years ago, especially for um, groups at the margins of politics, women who had yet to get the vote, workers, uh, feminists, internationalists, and so forth, they were all on the side of free trade, and in part they were because it was associated with a more active citizenship and democratic accountability, that parliament couldn't just um, uh, push through, or governments couldn't just push through policies, but that parliament was sort of respecting um, the public interest as taxpayers. But equally, I think it would be dangerous to uh, uh, sort of walk away uh, with a certain mythology of free trade, that free trade is all the good things in life. Um, there are dark spots. Um, uh, the empire is one. And I think the limits to um, very comprehensive um, social, let alone socialist measures, is another. Thank you.